Hi, everybody. I'm Greg Fischel. Welcome to bonus weather video number one for this week. And this week we're going to be uh, talking about uh, severe weather and the two main ingredients that contribute to it. One is wind shear and one is buoyancy. And so we're going to attack the wind shear issue today. And then on Friday, we'll talk about the uh, buoyancy or uh, the technical term for it is CAPE, which is an acronym for Convective Available Potential Energy. OK, always have to have an acronym, right? OK, so we're going to talk about wind shear. And one way to look at it is by using a tool called a hodograph, which is something we'll get to in just a second. And the hodograph gives us an idea of how the winds are changing with height. And so it is a strange turn of events. All right, so wind direction and wind speed. This is probably review for most, if not all of you, but the wind direction is the direction the wind is coming from, not the direction it is blowing toward, okay? So a southwest wind is coming from the southwest, blowing toward the northeast. A west wind is coming from the west, blowing toward the east. A north wind is coming from the north and blowing toward the south, okay? Now, if we take a look at the basic compass here, you have north, northeast, east, and so on, all the way around to north again. And the degrees that are associated with that, for north, you can either use 0 or 360. It really doesn't matter. Northeast is 45, east is 90, southeast is 135, south is 180, and you go all the way back around to the top. Now, you can break it down even more than that if you want to, and we will in just a second. Uh, you can have north-northwest, you can have west-northwest, west-southwest. Those are all in between these two directions that I have here. So this would be east-northeast, this would be north-northeast, north-northwest, and so forth. Okay, so let's take a look at just a typical wind profile that we might see in a severe weather uh, uh, episode or potential episode. So... At the surface, and by the way, uh, we usually use nautical miles, not knots and not miles per hour. So that's the reason I have that here. But at the surface, let's say we have a wind coming from the southeast at 10 knots. And at one kilometer, again, everything in science is metric, uh, we have a south-southeast wind at 20. At two kilometers, south at 30. Three kilometers, south-southwest at 40. Four kilometers, southwest at 50. And finally, at five kilometers, we are west-southwest at 60. So what's happening here is that the wind is obviously increasing in speed as you go up, and it's also turning around like this. It's starting off from the southeast and turning around to the southwest. So here is what a hodograph looks like as we plot those winds on top. So you have your origin right here in the middle. My cursor is, uh, there it is, right there in the middle. And so... Each one of these lines around that circle represents a wind speed. So the first circle is 10 knots, the second one is 20, third one is 30, fourth one is 40, fifth is 50, and the sixth one is 60. So each circle represents an increase of speed in, uh, by 10 knots. Now, contrary to what I just told you, where the wind direction is measured from where it's coming from and not blowing toward, with a hodograph, you actually draw an arrow that is pointing toward the direction the wind is coming or going toward. So remember, we had a southeast wind at 10 knots, okay? So a southeast wind is going to be blowing toward the northwest. So we draw a line from the origin to this first circle here, which represents 10 knots. Now, the next wind was out of the south-southeast at 20 knots. And so a south-southeast wind is blowing toward the north-northwest, and so we have this line here that goes up to the second line. The third wind was south at 30, and so we blow or draw an arrow from the origin up to the 30 line, straight out of the south, blowing toward the north. The next one was south-southwest at 40, and so now we have the line from the origin coming up to the fourth line here. Then we had southwest at 50, and finally west-southwest uh, west -southwest wind at 60 knots, okay? So this is what it looks like after you plot the winds. All the vectors uh, are originating at the center point, and the lines, obviously, the length of the line represents the strength of the wind. Now what you do is you play a game of connect the dots, or more accurately put, connect the arrowheads, okay? So we draw from the first line to the second, or first arrow to the second arrow, and then the second arrowhead to the third, the third to the fourth, the fourth to the fifth, and the fifth to the sixth. And so we have a nice line there, uh, or curve, if you will, uh, that is bending quite a bit as it goes uh, 
up in altitude. So the total amount of shear that is going on here can be looked at as this entire area underneath that curve, okay? So in this case, there's a lot of vertical wind shear over the lowest five kilometers. However, it has been found in recent years, uh, at least in many, many cases, that the lowest kilometer is really what you want to look at for the tornado potential. Now, you can still get a severe thunderstorm with a total shear over zero to five kilometers that is something like this, but the lowest one kilometer many, many times is what really dictates whether or not it's going to be just a severe thunderstorm or whether or not you're going to have tornado potential. Now, in this particular case, that shaded area looks pretty small, right? But can you imagine, and I just didn't have time to uh, make this graphic even more complicated than it already was, supposing this arrow here, okay, this is a surface arrow, and this one here, supposing, ooh, I'm going to go back there, Supposing this line, this arrow, went all the way up to, say, here, like up to 50 knots, okay? So now your shaded area would be much, much bigger. It would go from this arrowhead up to the arrowhead up here, and so you'd have a much bigger shaded area. And again, many times you can get rotation, a rotating updraft in a thunderstorm, but whether or not that rotation makes it all the way down to the ground is really what we're trying to assess. And that lowest zero to one kilometers is many, many times the giveaway as to whether or not it's going to be a severe thunderstorm outbreak without many tornadoes, if any, or whether or not it's going to be a major tornado outbreak. And again, that zero to one kilometer uh, layer is uh, many, many times the key one to look at. So that basically addresses the wind shear issue. Uh, again, on the next bonus weather video on Friday, we'll talk about the energy component or the buoyancy component uh, to this. And there's actually something called an energy helicity index. The, the, the amount of area underneath this curve here is referred to as the helicity. And so the helicity refers to wind shear and the energy refers to buoyancy. And there's actually something called the energy helicity index, which tries to combine both of those factors. And if you reach a certain threshold, then you start looking for the potential for uh, tornadic activity. So uh, we'll, we'll address the energy part of it on Friday. That's the wind shear part of it today. And I hope that wasn't sheer terror uh, for you to follow through all of this. So uh, that is it for now. Sorry this was so late, but uh, I must tell you that there was uh, quite a large amount of trigonometry that went into getting those arrows to show up in the right spot. I didn't want to approximate it. I wanted to make sure it was exactly right because that's just the way I am. And so uh, it took a little longer to do this one than normal, but I appreciate your patience and I hope it uh, was at least somewhat meaningful and understandable and educational. All right, that's it for now. You all have a wonderful rest of your Tuesday evening and we will talk to you soon. Take care.